So what are you going to do when you want to make a film? You're going to do exactly what my friend has done. You're just going to do it. You're going to jump into the deep end, and you're going to take the risk, and you're going to cash out something. That's what I did. I decided, OK, I want to get experience. I want to put something out there. I want to create short, a short film uh, that is selectable for festivals. Uh, and that's what I did. Um, I started, I have acting experience. So I thought, OK, I know a film set. I worked as a production assistant on advertising sets uh, in Cape Town, so I thought, I've got this, I know how it works. So I said, okay, I don't have money, I'm going to put my own money in there, I'm going to beg, threaten, blackmail, do everything I possibly can, but yeah, if you don't have a very fabulously rich kind of sugar person that you can pay in kind to fund your film, then uh, you're basically, yeah, that's what the situation you're going to be in. So that's what happened to me. I started the day of reckoning and I went looking for scripts. I found an English uh, uh, screenwriter and uh, we, uh, we, we translated his script to a Dutch context. And, okay, so we've got a nice compact, reasonably compact thing. But then I started making the first novice mistakes that maybe some of you will recognize. I love the scripts. So I thought, this is it. I'm going to do this. And I was studying for my master's degree and I thought, okay, these are the shots I'm going to do and I feel like I need Francis Ford Coppola. We got this is the storyboard and all that's uh, talking to the crew and it's all very creative and inspiring. So we have the first day on set. I've got weapons on set. I've got uniforms in public, open carrying weapons. I've got children on set. So that's like already a very toxic combination of elements. Uh, but okay, so far so good. I don't have a producer. I'm the producer. I don't have an AD. I am the AD. And that is just absolutely apocalyptic. So we get onto set on the first day. I said, okay, we're going to shoot this first shot, opening shot of the film in two hours. We're going to put all the extras in a room. It's in an old age home. And what happens is the camera has a slow push in. And the extras kind of move around. And they reveal our main character sitting there with a cloud of darkness hanging around it and being all depressed. It's a beautiful shot. I still love that shot, the opening shot of the film. And we've got all sorts of extras and friends and family and all sorts of people that have never been on a film set before. And an AD who hasn't read the script. So, okay, then uh, effectively what, have, what should have taken two hours, has to, uh, lunch has come and gone. We've broken for lunch. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. We're still working on one shot. Okay, so that's the first mistake. We keep on going. Uh, we work, we wrap way after 12 o'clock at night. That's day one of three days of shooting. We were shooting inside a Freemasons uh, hall in Harlem, where I live. And you know how crew work? 
you beforehand you say, listen guys, there are irreplaceable art objects in this place. Please be careful. Yeah, sure. We're careful. And then all these brawny, looks like a rugby side running into this artist set, and they grab paintings off the wall, and they snatch it up somewhere there. I hear glass smashing and breaking, all sorts of things happening. It's like an army marching through there, <laughs> ransacking and pillaging the whole place. Afterwards, they broke a constitution letter of hundreds of years old with the old the wax seal at the bottom. Irreplaceable damage, and a lot of very angry people. Uh, and I have to answer all of those questions. So that ambition, that drive to just do, want to go there and do something without the, the, the foresight of what it actually means. No set manager, I'm also the set manager, uh, turns around and bites you in the face. Great, so we go over schedule. The law is applicable there. I've already got the cops checking on set if I'm using the weapons. As I've said, I've, I'm going to use the weapons, all uh, uh, very strict rules and uh, how you should comply with that. Um, we're going way over schedule on the shoot, and morale starts going. So I thought, okay, great, I've got catering, I'm very happy with the catering, it's good that you mentioned that. Uh, uh, but now you've got a situation where you are actively asking the guardian, the parent of this child, to break the law with their own child. Because they're only allowed to work a certain number of hours uh, on set, they need specific breaks at specific times. So yeah, a very, a very harsh uh, a learning curve on my first short film, uh, but a, but a yeah, a very insightful experience. Uh, three days of shooting and three nights of shooting, and then in the situation and that is very typical of the Netherlands. If you want to go and shoot outside in public, you need a letter of permission from the municipality, and you also need a letter of uh, permission from the cops. So I went to the cops, and the cops said, "Okay, no, it's fine. We trust you. You, you, you." you you know, you stuck to the plan with the, with the, in the set with the, with the weapons there, so we give you this letter of permission to open carry weapons in the park where we're going to shoot the final uh, scene of the film with all different uniforms, Nazi uniforms, and guys with weapons. So they said yes, great, so then I went to the municipality and I asked them, okay, can you give us the same permission? No, you need eight weeks. <laughs> okay. Thank you, that's, that's very nice. I, I have, but can't you make it faster? I said, no, we can only give you a letter confirming that you have requested it. <laughs> I said, okay, well, okay, well, give me that. But I said, so what's gonna happen if we shoot without this letter of permission? No, you can't do that because if the cops arrive, then you need to show them our letter of permi permission. And I said, okay, but the cops know and they've already given me permission. Yes, but that doesn't count. <laughs> so so that is, that, that's kind of the situation. So what are we going to do? It's all my money, it's all my credits, it's all my friends, it's all the favors I could possibly uh, collect for this, for this project. And now we're going to shoot in a couple of weeks. So what do I do? I break the law and I take the risk. So we're in a park, open carrying weapons with only half the permission that you're supposed to have. That went well, but it's a major, major risk. I mean, it's weapons, you know, it's, 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 it's quite serious. So, some of the advantages of doing that kind of guerrilla filmmaking uh, approach in the Netherlands is it's not so unionized here. You know, you, 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 can, get, you can get favors, you can, you can motivate people to want to come on board onto your, onto your team. But once you start break actively and knowingly start breaking the law, it becomes a different kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So that went well, then I thought, okay, that's my first short film, major learning curve. I, uh, I took notes, I said, okay, this is ridiculous. Then my second short film, I'm going to look for something nice and compact. Two characters, one location, neat. No children, no weapons, no special letters of, of, of uh, you know, this and that. Okay, but okay, we can only afford three days of shooting. Great. <coughs> But then you're working with an art director who wants the credit, and a very talented art director, but a bit inexperienced art director. So you saw on the apricot tree all that morning frost, spring frost. It's all practical effect. It's all sprayed on or starch based powder that art department had to painstakingly, meticulously go with this. this uh, what do you call it? A, 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 
sifters. Sifters, yeah. Sifters. And sifters. just shake it as if they're doing uh, art direction on a on a on a on an uh, advertisement for cake icing. <laughs> so that was like a major misinterpretation of what the practicalities would be. So if I would have had a an, an experienced AD or an experienced art director on that set, I would have known that this is just ridiculous. So we got spray cans in for the detailed shot on the flower, so it looks exactly like ice. Unfortunately, that, that panned out very well. But then those spray cans, as soon as you use them too much, you can actually not use the entire content of that can. So the moment you, you continually spray, it clogs up and you throw it away. So the whole set, everything, it took endless, endless, endless time, and that was robbing and cannibalizing time off of the time I had with the actors. Then you also have on set here the situation where you have an older, a more experienced actor and a young guy that needs, needs to get into the role. So by take four, the new guy is coming to where he should be in his performance, but by take four, the older guy is completely empty. And it's just, it's, there's nothing believable coming out there. So then you need to try and find that balance. But the perfect storm really happened um, in the fact that you go for the, those three days on Gamble on the weather paid off, so that was a miracle in, in, in itself. <coughs> but the perfect storm <coughs> happened with audio and sound. The first thing that went wrong is the generator that we hired was broken. So they gave us a replacement generator, which was like a classic. Uh, I think what they built into that thing is a Second World War diesel submarine engine. <laughs> so that thing was bellowing toxic fumes into the neighborhood. <laughs> the neighbors are furious that came to our to set to threaten us numerous times with all sorts of things. And that thing made such a racket, such a terrible, terrible noise that the poor audio guy just said to me, listen, you're gonna have to do ADR because there's just nothing I can do. And the main character lives in Spain, so there you go. Okay, so, yeah, ADR, you all know what ADR is, right? Yeah. It's, uh, I was going to ask you. Yes, a ADR is, wow, well, that is it. Sorry. Um, uh, ADR is when you uh, record the dialogue in post. Mm -hmm. So the actor is going to fake the dialogue, on, you know. And that is a dreadful thing to want to have to do because I don't, I don't have much faith in that. And the actor needs to have that talent to be able to do that. Otherwise, it's going to take endless yeah. time. And, uh, and that's something that you don't have if, it's, uh, if you don't have the money. Dubbing, yes, basically. Yeah. So now I've got this poor audio guy, and he's a hard shot. He really saved my life uh, with numerous uh, uh, things on that uh, uh, film. Um, but he's incredibly strict. So, okay, so we've got that background sound. Uh, the shooting schedule is going up and down all sorts of ways and then that lot, I also get the information on that very morning that the other the actor that plays the Syrian refugee is leaving at four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> on the morning I'm told that because he has one chance to see his real mother and it will be the first time in six years that he sees his mom. So he's flying out to Dubai to see his mom. So I said, okay, well, I'm really happy for you. But I <laughs> your mom. So, um, uh, give your mom a kiss for me. So, so all that technical trouble starts pushing and crushing the time with the actors more and more and more and more and more. And that's an expensive price to have to pay. Um, so, okay, so we've got the diesel uh, 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 generator, we've got the angry neighbors. As soon as we start shooting dialogue, we hear like garden, electronic or, or garden equipment. So that, this guy's with, without telling us, because I spoke to the neighbors and said, we're going to shoot for three days, so if anything's happened, yeah. They didn't tell me, so on that day, uh, uh, there was on the one side, there was a uh, 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 what is my whole need in Engels? Gardener. A gardener, but like a professional high-end gardener, like a landscape kind of guy, yeah. with landscapey kind of equipment, coming in to make terrible, dreadful noise <laughs> on the one side. And we're still, we're still up there, we've got the actors ready to, to roll, we've got to full action, and we hear this noise on the one side. So we go there and we ask, well, what, what's going on? No, it's the gardener. So, but why did you tell it there's a god? I don't know, I didn't think it was relevant. <laughs> so, so that's a note. When you prep your set, when you do your recce, 
<laughs> ask specifically, are you getting a gardener or some sort of ridiculous thing with noise and all of that? And go and bribe those people with, with course, whatever you can, or threaten or like that. Uh, so that's on the one side. Okay, so we got the gardener to take a break, so we've got like one hour to shoot a whole dialogue scene. Now. And as soon as we start shooting again on the other side with the next door neighbors, there's Polish guys coming in to strip paint with sanders. <laughs> and paint and dust flowing all over the set. So <laughs> then you have to go there and like in trying to communicate with them in sign language, Google Translate, case beer, one hour quiet. <laughs> and so, so in the end, it was just, uh, it was actually too close for comfort. It was too tight than you would want to have it uh, happen. And it's definitely what I learned there is never, ever to set my foot on set again without an 80 who I will trust alone with my wife. <laughs> so, so that is bas basically this, the, uh, the situation. And for my third short film, which is definitely a more high-risk situation, that was a 48-hour film, we, we dotted every T, crossed every T and dotted every I, and I had an AD on set that I had, you know, I love doing all the creative free thinking and the storyboarding and the decoupage and all that stuff. It's like, I mean, it's gorgeous. just doing that. And this guy came in and said, okay, you want shot A, B, and C, but we've got time for two of those, so make a choice. And that is what you want as a director. That's what I want as a director. Is that AD forcing me to make the hard choices? Yeah. Mm. So not your your own creativity can be a, a maelstrom of chaos where choices become tough. Where the question about choices, someone said, yeah. yeah, where choices become tough because you've got a vision and you've got a clear vision, and if if you did your preparation, that's on paper, and your crew knows what is expected of them. But that game of making shots with your DOP can get completely out of hand. So you can over-prepare on that. And that's the function of the AD that comes in and tells you, listen, make your choices. And then you make a choice based on what is best for your narrative. <laughs> assistant director. The assistant director. He's, he's, the, he's the guy or the girl that you want on set. And that's, I would never ever sacrifice that. I would sacrifice a runner for a production assistant before I ever sacrifice an AD again. I'll carry equipment myself before I sacrifice the AD ever again. So some harsh lessons, but all great fun. Very good. Yeah. Very real. Thank you. I'm a filmmaker, but I'm an imposter, <laughs> invited by my friend Russ Murphy. So it looks like the Murphys will follow you to the last world. We are kind of here. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my good friend Donald Ramsey used to say, you know, there are known unknowns, there's no problem, and there are unknown unknowns. And that's the territory we're getting into. Yes. And uh, the guy called Eddie will going to tell you, look, Sandy, you can have a face. And then you get a compromise. Yeah. And the last thing I learned from you is that you have a plan. Yeah. It always goes differently on set than you expect. You can plan it into the minutest detail. It will always go in a different way than you expect. That's a fact. That, I, don't think, I honestly don't think there are any exceptions to that. I mean, if, if everything goes exactly according to plan, then I will become very nervous. <laughs> because it means I'm missing something, or I'm not noticing something. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a point or a moment where, I mean, after you finish shooting something like that, you're probably like, oh, God damn it. Um, but then was there a moment in post where there was some revelation where it was like a, a lifting of the burden, like, oh, we actually might have a great short film well, in our hands? The thing is uh, uh, morale. I really like that you mentioned morale, and it's not only catering. Right. But more, maybe even equally important to catering. Right. And I got a compliment on that set that the, the, from the crew is that they've never had that good catering that good on a set before. <laughs> so I've been, I was able to get a, a chef, and she could cater to everyone's needs. The one actor was vegan and whatever, you know. So they had uh, she could she she rocked that like a, like a tight ship. You you can imagine. And we had a different location, a house where we were sleeping in. 
uh, 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 like a kilometer further away. So everyone really broke for lunch. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because you don't break for lunch, but know this and know that. And that. You break, you leave, you go, you eat, you come back. Yeah. You really relax, even if it's a short period of time. And obviously the director is walking up and down in a state of absolute <laughs> panic. And you, if you can eat in that situation, well, force yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, 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 but morale is m much way more uh, than catering. Uh, what I like to uh, create on set is a positive, constructive atmosphere. And uh, because I had that experience, I, I told uh, uh, Rafir about that, uh, working as a PA on commercial shoots in uh, in Cape Town, is they treat you like the lowest of the low. Uh, dehumanizing mistreatment of the crew is the culture there on commercial shoots. And I just decided on the, in that moment, uh, was uh, maybe a bit younger than you are uh, now when I did that, is if I am ever on in some sort of authoritative position on film set and I see someone mistreating someone below them in the uh, hierarchy, that I would come down them on them like a, like a ton of bricks. And, but it's not, it's not like a vengeance thing, it's a, a creating a culture of wanting to succeed and to tap into the passion of every crew member and every filmmaker in your team, pre-production uh, production and post-production. If you, if, if you can get that culture going, they would walk through fire for you. And that is crucial for me as a filmmaker. And that's something that is, that, that, that is, that is you know, give them that cre creative ownership of what you are doing. You can't go and have a debate on every creative decision on set. Obviously not. But that sound guy, ask him what he needs. Ask him what he can. What, what does he think? What can we use here? How, how can we contribute? How can we make the scene better than it is? And, 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 and just to have that atmosphere on set of people really wanting and to be extra, extra, uniquely motivated uh, to to. Get that thing in the can. So regardless of all the external factors, you were confident even during the Murphy's oh, yes. Law that it was going to be yes. something. So it wasn't, it wasn't even before post-production because we've got the monitor there and we've got the art department people who are on the edge of psychological collapse. We're, we're in, in the one form of this psychedelic experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should have seen the set with that power stuff. It was like... Everything was covered. We had to cover the equipment to prevent that dust from entering everywhere. So everyone was walking around like white ghosts, completely covered in this power, completely and utterly, like highly stressed, strung up people covered in white power. <laughs> so, so it was, it was, it was, if it wasn't that hilarious. Um, I mean that if you ever get close to some sort of medical emergency there, you're right, right on top of the right there. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a, but as we are seeing the shots, and I like to challenge the crew with technically complex things, but also a very important part of my study is to, uh, because, uh, because I was an actor and because I, then you kind of developed this theory in your head that, you know, I, I know how to work with actors which is completely untrue, so I'm now really focusing on that again, trying to find the balance, is, uh, is, 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 so I really wanted to go and direct the camera, to really have creative camera movement, and narratively strong camera movement, that's very important to me, uh, uh, where you achieve more things with one shot than only establishing. Breaking Bad is a good example where they go from wide to close in one simple crab, the crab is when the camera moves sideways, so you've got a wide angle of a storage building, it's just random, you think, okay, we're at a storage facility, and as the camera crabs, you reveal a bomb in the corner there. Mm -hmm. You set up the whole thing in one shot. Yeah. So I love that. that. That's the kind of shots I wait for. But they take time, and they're stressful. Mm -hmm. But when the crew gets that adrenaline kick from that, that endorphin rush, from seeing that shot on the monitor being successful, they become like, like a pack of hyena. Mm -hmm. They just, they smell blood and they want more. And I, I feel that fight as far as I possibly can. And that's beautiful to see crew members of all shapes and sizes and all levels where, where I don't see it as levels, but every, every cog in that machine, to see them bloom in that context is precious. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.
Roger. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he's a writer and director and illustrator of Italy, New York, and a prestigious global cinematographer.